Hi everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast. All 96 episodes are available at ChinaHistoryPodcast.com and via a multitude of aggregators that listeners with discriminating taste use to download from. Two episodes ago, we were in the 15th century during the Ming Dynasty. Then, last time, we went back a few hundred more years to the period of the Southern Song, 12th century China. Today, we go back even further to the 4th century A.D., to the Eastern Qin Dynasty. This is another Qin Dynasty from the Jurchens of the last episode. The character Jin, fourth town for this dynasty, J-I-N. This is a different Chinese character than the Jurchen Qin Dynasty of Yuefei's time. I featured the Eastern Jin in episode CHP-22. You had the Western Jin and the Eastern Jin. Just like the Zhou, Han, and Song dynasties, the Jin is broken up into two parts. Western Jin, founded by Sima Yan, who reigned as Jin Wu Di. His brief dynasty ran from 265 to 318. They were kicked out of Luoyang by the Xiongnu, and that ancient capital was sacked, along with Chang'an, in 316. So the Jin dynasty was reconstituted down in the south in Jiankang, which we know today as Nanjing. The eastern Jin didn't last long either, falling in 420 to the victorious general Liu Yu, whose northern expedition between 409 and 416 won back most of the land south of the Yellow River, including Luoyang. He puts an end to the eastern Jin after barely a hundred years of existence. Liu Yu, we discussed in CHP 22, he went on to found the Liu Song dynasty. And amidst all this fighting and disunity in China comes today's topic. Wang Xizhi, born exactly 800 years before Yue Fei in 303 AD. Wang Xizhi was born at a very bad time for the Jin. They were only eight years away from getting chased out of the capital in Luoyang. Wang Xizhi's greatness was achieved during the Eastern Jin. So like Yue Fei, whose life straddled the Northern and Southern Song, Wang Xizhi's life also witnessed the fall and rise of a dynasty. The Jin, just a quick refresher, founded by Sima Yan, grandson of Sima Yi of Cao Wei State, this was the northernmost of the three kingdoms. This was the land of Cao Cao and his family. Sima Yan overthrows them and establishes the Western Jin. He's the guy, if you recall from the episode, who had 10,000 concubines at his beck and call. He was a man of great excesses, uh, Sima Yan was. He was the Jin Emperor Wu, Jin Wu Di. He founds the Jin, unifies China, and then blows it all later on. And we conclude the Western Jin with the sad and tragic tale of the Emperor Min, who had the misfortune of being the one reigning when the Xiongnu of the Han Zhao state came roaring in, the Han Zhao state being one of the 16 kingdoms that took over the north. After the Xiongnu and the four other tribes take control of the North China heartland, Sima Rei of the Sima family, the Jin founding family, he sets up the new Jin government in Jiankang, what I, as I said, present-day Nanjing, and he reigns as Jin Yuan Di, from 317 to 323. And if you remember, I'll say it again, as it's important to know, so horrific was it for the Han Chinese of the north under the yoke of these northern barbarians during the 16 kingdoms period, both common people and the aristocratic elites started to flee en masse to the south of China. Not only Han Chinese, but Xiongnu as well. These were the first major migrations to the south of these what's known as guest people, or Hakka, or Kujiaren. So into this unsettled time, the subject of our topic, Wang Xizhi, was born. He lived from 303 to 361. As I said, his life straddled the reigns of three Western Jin emperors and five from the Eastern Jin. This tells you right away these emperors never reigned for too long. And as a point of reference, this uh, is the time of the Sassanid Empire in Persia. Constantine the Great and Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, was just getting underway. Christianity had found its way to Britain right around now. And in India, this was the start of the Gupta Empire. Wang Xizhi was already a 22-year-old prodigy in his day, climbing his way up the ladder, when a crowd of religious men gathered together in Nicaea in 325. 
to participate in the First Ecumenical Council. Why do we feature Wang Xijie? What's his significance? He's China's greatest calligrapher, that's why. This is generally agreed by all educated people familiar with this art. China's greatest calligrapher. And there are hundreds and hundreds who have been revered and their works treasured throughout history and down to this present day. But Wang Xijie comes to mind whenever the apposition greatest calligrapher of China is used. We have calligraphy, of course, in English as well, other languages too, but Chinese is special. Chinese isn't limited to 26 letters that you could write in you know, all kinds of beautiful and aesthetically pleasing ways. Chinese, with the pictograms that evolved into the Chinese characters we know today, this was what calligraphy was invented for. The art of writing Chinese characters in this traditional method, using the four treasures that any aristocrat, man or woman, would have in their possession, was the highest possible expression of one's character. Some say you are what you eat. In China, back in the day, your calligraphy could tell almost anyone everything there was to know about you. The personality, character, moral worth, and emotion of any high-born, educated, 4th century aristocrat could be manifested in the way they handled a brush on paper. By the Tang Dynasty, how you handled a brush determined where you were slotted in the civil service bureaucracy. That was what mattered most. This was an art that was entirely practiced and enjoyed by the elites of China. Firstly, you had to be literate, and in 4th century China, that wasn't so common outside aristocratic circles. This was an interesting time, the period Wang Xijie was born into. It had been about 300 years since Cai Lun invented his paper-making process around 100 AD. So around the time of Wang Xijie, paper-making had become quite developed, and the economics had been worked out by then. For writing with a brush, nothing made a better substrate than paper. Up until now, Chinese had been writing on silk or on bamboo and other materials. But now, with paper... The four treasures of the study could be used to their maximum effect, and a thousand subtleties could be expressed like only these guys knew how to do. These four treasures that I've spoken of, the Wenfang Sibao, were the brush, ink, paper, and inkstone. Bi, mo, zhi, yen. So Wang Xijie lived in the age when paper had just come into its own, and just as printing busted things wide open as far as allowing people to read, so did paper have the same effect on the written word. During the Eastern Jin, woodblock printing was still hundreds of years away. So once paper became perfected to the point where, you know, it could be used by more than just the emperor, it created the first mini-revolution in all kinds of ways. Literature, record-keeping and administration, communication, education, you know, and of course, with respect to calligraphy. Only one bad thing. Paper decomposes after time, especially if it's high in acid and lignin. We can even see how paper fades over the period of our own lifetime. Imagine a thousand years. So, sad to say, nothing at all of the 1,000 calligraphic works of Wang Xijie exists today. No one has a single piece of anything he ever did. With his own hand, at least. Wang Xijie was a southerner from a rich aristocratic literary family. That is to say, they came from a long line of scholars who worked for the imperial court and various functions. Born in the year 303 in the city of Shaoxing, a city that keeps on showing up in our podcast. Shaoxing in Zhejiang province, right between Ningbo and Hangzhou. His life will forever be associated with that city and the Orchid Pavilion, that fabled place where poets, calligraphers, and other distinguished Literati of the day would hang out together, compose poems, drink wine, exhibit their calligraphy, say witty things around each other, and enjoy the life that a southern aristocratic gentleman enjoyed. Wang Xijie came from a long line of respected calligraphers, so he wasn't the first in his family to shine. The Wang family were well known and held in very high esteem by society. Of the 100 noted calligraphers of their day during the Jin period, 20 came from the Wang clan. 
As it was expected, Wang Shijie had to rise up the cursus honorum, just like any Roman official might have done. There was an established road that one followed as far as education and the path one would follow to reach the heights of success. He served first as an official, but in time found it not to his taste. Since he had a lot of money and wanted for nothing, Wang Shijie did what a lot of people sometimes do when they have too much money. He became a recluse. And he spent all his time practicing calligraphy and developing this style of his that would change the way people wrote Chinese characters to this day. As I said, nothing survives today from the time of Wang Shijie. If that's true, are we taking others' words for it, or do we know what his calligraphy looked like? The thing to do back in the day was to make copies of the masters and to practice it. Over and over and over. So thanks to this practice of always copying the masters, although nothing from Wang Shijie's hands survives to this day, we still know what his writing looked like. There are twelve or so copies, or copies of copies of Wang Shijie's calligraphy that have survived to this day. It's often said that behind every great man is a woman, and in Wang Shijie's case, this was most true. Although it was his. Esteemed father, a noted calligrapher himself, who first taught his son the art, the teacher who history has credited with the most influence on Wang Shijie is none other than his father's cousin, Madame Wei Wei Shuo, also known in the history books as Lady Wei. She lived from 272 to 349 and was herself considered the ear to the style of the greatest calligrapher up till that time, Zhong Yao, also known as Zhong Yao. He Came out of the end of the Eastern Han and into the Three Kingdoms period, serving as an official in the state of Cao Wei. And before Zhong Yao, there was the venerable Cai Yong, also of the Eastern Han. So the list goes on you know, over the centuries. The, the crude Chinese characters of the Shang, Zhou, and Han now morphed into newer forms of scripts, and each of these scripts would be blown out with hundreds of styles and variations and subtleties that distinguished certain calligraphers and made them immortal. I'll give you the Tencent intro to Chinese script styles. Everyone knows Chinese characters evolved over time. Prior to these Bronze Age dynasties, you also had the Jiaku Wen, or Oracle Bone Script. This was how they used to write in the Shang Dynasty, 1675 to 1046 BC. First, to make a great contribution was the illustrious and infamous prime minister who served China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang. This was Li Si. He came up with the standardized small seal script. This was introduced during the Qin period and then further developed and stylized during the Zhou dynasty. The seal script was the gold standard until this flatter and wider looking script followed. That was the next great development of Chinese writing. This came during the time of the Han Dynasty that followed the Qin. As the name suggests, this new clerical script was mainly developed for use in record-keeping and administration. Frankly, most of these archaic scripts aren't easy to read, and most people can't recognize a lot of them. During this time, Zhou and Han Dynasty, the Chinese characters we all know and love today, hadn't quite evolved yet. These are the ones you see carved into these ancient relics and into all these bronze vessels and dings from the Zhou period. It's always a fun game to play with my Chinese comrades when we encounter some ancient scroll or stone rubbing or whatever that's written in these Zhou and Han Dynasty scripts from 2,000 years ago. We look at these ancient characters and try to guess you know, what they are. Some characters, of course, are quite simple, and you could know what they are, no matter ancient or modern. But most, you really have to know your characters. But up to this time, the whole idea of Chinese characters as an art form had not yet developed. The third major form of script is the running script. It's called running script, because like cursive, the characters are not written stroke by stroke, but is a running movement of the brush without lifting it off the paper. Well, actually, that's the grass script, the uh, fourth kind of Chinese script style. Running script was also known as semi-cursive script, and grass script is known as cursive. 
with the semi-cursive running script, you might lift your brush off the paper to finish a character. But with the cursive grass script, this is pure Chinese writing with shortcuts that allowed you to write any Chinese character without lifting the brush from the paper until the character is fully written. This is very hard to read, and I could hardly read anything written in cursive. This grass script, or running script, this is generally what you'll see in the everyday world of jotting stuff down in Chinese. Not me, of course. I still have to write it in the regular script. When I first began learning these characters, of course, it was a real struggle. There's no way to learn it except by pure memorization and writing them over and over. Then early on, after I went to China for the first time in 1980, I discovered everyday people in their daily life wrote their characters using this completely unrecognizable kind of cursive and semi-cursive. This made me quite dejected as I was barely learning the characters as they're printed in a book or wherever. And now most Chinese in their daily life of writing in China use a form of cursive. I got over this despair and could read a little now. Can't write that way, though. The last script to develop is the regular script. And this is where Lady Wei and Wang Xijie enter our story. I guess you could say they took this script to such great heights that pretty much in our time, this is how Chinese write their written language. It was Lady Wei who gave us the eight principles of Yong. This was known as the Yong Zi Ba Fa. I myself, when I was studying Chinese in college, was taught Lady Wei's Eight Principles of Yong. And my calligraphy teacher, Mr. Chang, hammered it into me each week. I spent a whole semester writing just one single character, nothing more. The character Yong, third tone, means forever. You see this character a lot tattooed on people's bodies. The special thing about this character that Lady Wei taught was that contained within this one single character were all eight of the common strokes used in the regular script. Now, I won't get into the details because not unless you know Chinese does this mean anything. But suffice to say, to write almost any Chinese character, you would use a combination of these eight main strokes. So by mastering this one single Chinese character, Yong, you could apply this technique to write almost any character. You could spend hours and days and weeks practicing this one single character. It looks easy. It isn't. The other thing we know Lady Wei for is her 1,000 character long treatise known as the Illustrated Formation of the Writing Brush, the Bi Zhan Tu. This was the primer used by generations of budding calligraphers to hone their skill. In this treatise, Lady Wei explains about the usage of the four treasures that I named, as well as how to adopt the right posture and how to use a brush correctly. Back in those days, for women, there was a four-inch thick bulletproof glass ceiling that could not be broken no matter what. So it's unknown whether we should be singing the praises of Wei Shuo over Wang Xijie. Obviously, her prospects in 4th century China were limited compared to someone like Wang Xijie. Wang Xijie dedicated his entire life to calligraphy. He traveled to the north of China in his younger days to meet with the popular calligraphers of the day. And over time, he developed the radically new grass script. This was seen as a great departure from the standard way of writing that had been around since the Zhou and Han dynasties. It's commonplace today, and shopkeepers and fishmongers today use a crude grass script. But back in the 4th century... This was revolutionary. It was one of those things where, after a while, the aristocrats and officials wondered how they ever lived without it. Wang Xijie has many claims to fame. Another one is that he was the father and personal trainer of Wang Xianzhi. Wang Xijie, Wang Xianzhi, this father and son team, with the teachings of Lady Wei Shuo and Wang Xijie's father, these four had a major impact on how Chinese characters were written forever after. And their calligraphy is admired above all by the greatest connoisseurs in Asia. And you cannot believe how many deadly, serious collectors and connoisseurs of Chinese calligraphy are 
spread out across the Far East, you know, let alone the whole world. Wang Xianzhi, in his own lifetime, surpassed his esteemed and revered father as far as who was the greatest calligrapher of his day. For the next three, four hundred years, it was Wang Xianzhi who was mentioned before Wang Xijie, but we'll see, come the Tang Dynasty, Wang Xijie has a very powerful and magnificent admirer in Mr. Li Shimin, a.k.a. the Taizong Emperor. Wang Xianzhi, no doubt, had an excellent trainer in his father, but his greatness lies on taking his father's achievement in developing the script that was in between the cursive and the running scripts. And this was called the running cursive script. Over the period of the next few centuries, during the period of the Southern and Northern dynasties and into the Sui, the admiration and glorification of these 4th century calligraphers really took off. By the time of the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907, Wang Xijie's name had attained a cult-like status, though nothing from any of these Jin Dynasty calligraphy masters survives to this day. There are copies and copies of copies. These copies are pretty faithful to the originals, so although, thanks to Mother Nature and Father Time, the works of these great Jin Dynasty calligraphers like Wang Xijie, Wang Xianzhi, Lady Wei, haven't survived, enough people kept their work alive by meticulously copying the originals. These copies of the great masters were all the rage during the Tang Dynasty. There was quite a trade in these works by the masters, and as you'd expect, there was also quite a thriving business and forgeries and fakes. The elites of Tang Dynasty aristocratic society would collect these copies of the masters, not only in China, but in Japan and Korea as well as in Vietnam. The fame and reputation of Wang Xijie spread far and wide. And this is especially true in Japan, where Wang Xijie's name is respected above all other Chinese calligraphers. So it's really in the Tang Dynasty that Wang Xijie's name and reputation was raised to the great heights that we view him today. He and his son were referred to as the Two Wangs. They really attained cult-like status. Some believe the Two Wangs were too good. Students of calligraphy were sometimes warned by their masters not to be too perfect like Wang Xijie, since the greatness of the calligraphy might diminish the literary significance of what they were writing. During the Tang, the regular script developed by Wang Xijie became the standardized script of the day. And my friends, it's been that way ever since. Emperor Tang Taizong, arguably one of the greatest uh, of China's emperors, sent emissaries to a monk named Bian Cai and tried repeatedly to obtain his copy of this greatest of Wang Xijie's surviving works. For the emperor had learned that this monk had come into possession of a Wang Xijie original. And the story goes on how his censor, Xiao Yi, was finally sent to meet with this monk and how he tricked the monk, Bian Cai, is one of the great old legends of the Tang Dynasty. And when he passed from this world in 649, the Taizong Emperor willed that he be buried with his most treasured possession, his copy of Wang Xijie's signature work, the 353 AD masterpiece Orchid Pavilion Preface. And when word spread far and wide that the great Taizong Emperor asked to be buried with this work, the boost to Wang Xijie's place in Chinese history was assured forever. And this preface to the collection of Orchid Pavilion poems, the Lanting Ji Xu, was a compilation of 37 poems in all. They were written in the year 353, where one day 42 literati, including Wang Xijie, met at this magical pavilion in Shaoxing, here in these works composed in this idyllic natural surrounding. The linkage was first made between Zhuangzi's Taoist philosophies and the beautiful landscapes beloved of poets, painters, and calligraphers. This busted open the whole nature poetry movement in China. Along the banks of a winding creek, these men played their drinking games at this orchid pavilion, and 26 of the 42 gathered there wrote these poems. They were compiled into a single work, 
and Wang Xichir wrote the preface in his semi-cursive calligraphic hand, 324 characters in 28 lines. And he revolutionized how Chinese ever after would all write their characters. Of those 324 characters, one of them, Zhi, the same Zhi as in Wang Xichi, this common character appears 20 times in his preface, and not a single one is written alike. It's truly one of the Chinese nation's most sacred of sacred relics. You can see a copy hanging in the Gu Gong in the uh, Forbidden City in Beijing. So that's it for the Shu Sheng, the Sage of Calligraphy. You know, a copy of Wang Xichi's work sold recently at auction. This was in November 2010. It was a copy of Wang's work. Four lines of characters written on a silk scroll during the Tang Dynasty. It sold for 308 million RMB in dollars that amounted to 46 million U.S. or 29 million pounds sterling. For 46 million, I'm betting that was not just any ordinary copy. This one had quite a halfway decent provenance being faithfully handed down along a chain of very serious collectors going back to the Yuan Dynasty. So I guess that's going to be it for this little intro into the world of Wang Xijie and Chinese calligraphy. It's not an easy subject to discuss because, you know, like all fine arts, there's no easy way to teach it or explain it. So he's a guy worth knowing about. Certainly all who go through the Chinese school system are taught about him. It's a pity his name isn't one of those easy-to-say ones. Xi Zhi, X-I-Z-H-I. Ouch, that X and the Z-H-I, Zhi, sound. Absolute killers if you haven't studied Mandarin. This is our 96th show, hour, am I royal again? I have my friend, Mr. Ray Harris Jr., coming out uh, tomorrow. He's nice enough to be flying in for my big 100th show extravaganza. I thought by now I'd be on number 100, but things didn't work out that way. So Ray will be here in time for the 97th episode, which I'll upload after my 99th. I remember last year, I was in Hong Kong at the time, uh, listening to Mike Duncan's 100th History of Rome episode. That was very nice. And I said, if the day ever comes when I make it to 100 episodes, I'm going to have to do the same thing as Mike Duncan. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you once again. As the great one in Kansas City says, I hope you enjoyed that. Got a couple emails asking when we're going to go back to modern times. That's coming. I'm trying to think of one more good one from the ancient days. Happy Labor Day to all my fellow Americanskis, wherever you are in the world. Think about the working people and everything they've done for us. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from baking hot and always sunny Southern California, wishing you all the very best, and I hope you'll join us next week for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.